Hello, my name is Tom Repass of Canyon Rim Honeybees in the beautiful Black Hills of South Dakota. This presentation is about swarm prevention and management. Now, I'm not going to talk about uh, the, the swarm that you see on my face. That's uh, an artificial or shook swarm. Uh, and the techniques to make the swarm for a bee beard are very similar to some of the shook swarm that uh, techniques we might use to prevent swarms. Um, but no, we're going to be talking about swarms from our hives that are attempting to fly away. And honestly, swarm prevention is always better than swarm management. You don't want to drive up to your bee yard one day and see a swarm up in the top of the tallest tree in the area. And now you have to try to find a way to manage the situation, uh, if you even can, before that swarm decides to fly away to wherever they're going to form their new nest. In this presentation, I'll talk about swarm behavior of honeybees, how and why it occurs. It's very important to understand the biology behind this so that by doing so, you'll be better at knowing uh, what to recognize when bees are thinking about swarming and what to do to prevent it from happening. I'll talk about reasons why beekeepers may want to not allow their colonies to swarm. I'll identify some of the underlying factors which may encourage a colony to swarm and then review some of the signs that suggest swarming may be imminent. Uh, I'll review some of the methods to minimize and prevent swarming. Uh, there literally are dozens, if not hundreds, of methods to prevent swarming, and I'll just touch on some of the ones that are more popular and useful. And then finally, I'll talk about swarm catching and then swarm traps. Well, over the years, I've learned there's three philosophies regarding swarming among beekeepers. First, uh, swarming is totally natural. Just let them be. Uh, this tends to be the, uh, the, the belief in, in those who we call bee havers. They have bees, but they don't really mess with them very much. They're not really beekeepers. They're not managing uh, the bees. Uh, but, you know, in defense of that, this is what feral colonies do all the time. It's how they reproduce. Uh, and also, to some extent, it might help with mite management among feral colonies. Uh, however, if you live in the city or the suburbs, your neighbors might not be very happy if uh, they see a cloud of bees flying through their backyard, or worse yet, clustering uh, on a tree or somewhere in their backyard. And then there's these beekeepers who say, my colonies never swarm. Uh, these folks either are lying, uh, or maybe they're just in a little bit of denial. I remember a few years back, somebody told me they came home and they saw a swarm above their beehives. And they said, wow, that's pretty neat, a, a swarm, a wild swarm just came in and they wanted to be near our hive, so they clustered right over our hives. And I said, that's probably one of, from one of your hives. And I mean, unless you have a neighbor nearby, you know, or, or, or there's a feral colony nearby. And they said, oh, no, no, it wasn't from, there's nobody near us. It must be a wild swarm. And I kind of let them think what they wanted to think. But, you know, it would be extremely unlikely for a, a swarm to fly miles just to land over the top of your own hives. I mean, if there's bees in a tree near your beehives, um, chances are they're from your hives, uh, unless there's a neighbor, you know, right next door to you that also happens to have beehives. And then finally, there's those of us who know that swarming, to some extent, is inevitable, as this is what bees do in the spring, but we'd like to try to keep it from happening as much as possible, uh, in, uh, you know, for various reasons. So let's talk about swarming behavior and some of the biology behind this. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this book by Dr. Tom Seeley, Honey Bee Democracy. I strongly recommend it. He goes into detail in a very uh, easy to read uh, about all the different uh, you know, behaviors that go into swarming and then how a colony decides which nest site it ultimately is going to choose. Even if someone's not a beekeeper, but they're simply interested in nature and honeybees, I strongly recommend this book. Now in the spring, after winter has come to an end, flowers begin blooming and there's lots of incoming floral resources. New brood is being raised and the colony population begins increasing. At some point, there are enough bees and there's enough incoming floral resources that the bees decide to make preparations for swarming. Uh, this includes producing drones, which emerge and uh, begin flying to the drone congregation areas where they look for virgins to mate with. Queen cells begin being drawn out and polished, and eventually eggs are laid in these cups and they become queen cells, and the bees begin uh, raising queens. Well, at some point after the queen cells are capped, the colony decides to swarm. About half the bees, along with the old queen, leave the colony, 
they form a cluster, usually uh, at the top of a, or on, on a tree or a bush. Sometimes it can be very high off the ground, other times it can be very close to the ground. Sometimes it can be on a fence or a building or pretty much anywhere. Sometimes they even land on the ground itself. Now, if the queen did not come out of the colony with them, the swarm realizes this immediately and they fly back. Uh, sometimes colonies will attempt to swarm. They'll fly out and then fly back, fly out and fly back. It's more than likely due to the queen not coming out with them. Sometimes uh, the queen will be lost. She'll have clipped wings and she'll end up in, a, in, in the grass with a small uh, ball of bees around her. Typically, swarming occurs on a warm, sunny day with minimal wind between 10 and 2 p.m. Uh, immediately after uh, forming a cluster, they send out scouts to look for a potential new nest site. If you look in this video, you'll see at least two scouts waggle dancing in two different directions. They found two potential nest sites in two different uh, locations. And again, the book Honeybee and Democracy goes into great detail how the swarm decides which of these nest sites might be the best one to eventually fly to. Eventually, the bees decide which nest site best meets their needs, and the entire swarm flies to their new home. Typically, a, a hollow tree, but it could be uh, many places, uh, sometimes even places where they're not wanted. Dr. Seeley uh, has written a lot about swarming and the ideal nest location, and this slide will be shown again later in the presentation. Uh, it's important to remember when we're trying to build swarm traps to try to do something or build something that will emulate what the bees considered a perfect nest location. The volume uh, on average is 40 liters, but it, it can be actually rather wide uh, range. And 40 liters, to give you an idea, that's roughly the volume of a single 10 frame deep box. Uh, they prefer higher sites from the ground. Uh, basically, uh, they want to be safe from predators. Uh, so at least nine feet or more is, is perfect. They don't want to be on a too exposed of a site with wind or, or uh, too much sun. They like a smaller entrance hole, maybe two square inches or no more than that. And, that, and the dry site that's, uh, you know, not drafty. Uh, and if there happens to be other old comb in there, the bees will definitely go for that because it's easier to move into a, a house, a, a, a future home, where there's actually a comb available that they don't have to build from scratch. So in the original colony, the virgin queens begin to emerge. If you open up your colony during swarm season and you see open queen cells like this, more than likely the original swarm, the prime swarm with the queen, has left and uh, they're gone. Now sometimes uh, during a rainy cool period of weather, uh, the, uh, the swarm can't fly, so what they'll do is they'll keep the virgin queens within the cells and they'll feed them, but they won't let them get out so they don't start fighting amongst each other. Uh, until the weather warms up and then the prime swarm with the old queen can fly off. And then if there's still too many bees, they may have what we call after swarms, uh, one or more after swarms after the main swarm that have virgin queens within them. Eventually, though, the original the colony decides that the population has been depleted enough and no further swarms are cast. Uh, then the, uh, the virgin queen, whichever one is the, the winner, they may fight. Uh, and, and whichever one is left will go out on a mating flight and then beginning lay, laying eggs and setting up housekeeping uh, as the new queen. From the perspective of the bees themselves, uh, the swarm versus the original colony, they have different advantages and, and different challenges they have to deal with. The swarm, the advantage they have is that they have brought a tested mated queen with them. Now she's an old queen, but they know that she's mated because she was the mother queen that uh, produce the original colony. So they don't have to risk having the, the queen go out on a mating flight. And for that matter, if the queen is lost as they're trying to swarm or leave the hive, uh, they'll just go back to the original hive where they were from. But they've got a lot of challenges. They need to find a good nest site as soon as possible. Sometimes if they can't find a nest site, they'll just stay where they are, resulting in an open air nest site, like under a branch. And up north, that's uh, pretty much going to, they're doomed. They're not going to be able to survive. Perhaps down south, they might be able to make it, but not up north. Once they find a nest site, assuming that there's, it's not an old colony that, uh, that had died out, uh, they'll have to start building new comb as soon as possible so the queen can lay eggs and they can begin raising new baby bees to replace the older bees as they die off. 
and then they must gather enough resources uh, for whatever summer is left so they will have enough store to survive the, the, on, the uh, winter that is coming. The original colony, of course, their advantage is they have uh, already built comb, a good nest location, and often plenty of stores of honey and pollen. Uh, so they're 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 set from that way, but the challenge is they need to have a virgin queen fly out and be mated. If she is not mated, or if she's lost, a bird eats her, a dragonfly, um, or she fails in any other way, that colony is doomed because they can't uh, raise any more queens. And so th there are risks to swarming from from both the swarms uh, perspective as well as the point of view of the original colony. You know why do they do it? Well, the the species must reproduce and. Uh, by swarming, the, the original colony can spread into new uh, places and locations, and the species uh, can continue. So why, why do beekeepers perhaps not want their colonies to swarm? Well, for one, uh, you know, if they swarm, they're unlikely to produce as much honey as compared to colonies that did not swarm. Looking at normal population uh, growth, uh, this different differs depending on exactly you know where you are. In the south, it's going to be earlier. In the north, maybe a little bit later. But in general, the population begins increasing in the spring, reaching peak population in early to midsummer, hopefully uh, in sync with the honey flow, so that as much honey as possible can be brought in, hopefully with a surplus, so the beekeeper can harvest whatever the bees won't need. If that colony swarms, however, before the honey flow, there's going to be a decrease in the population, and they're not going to be able to produce quite as much honey as they would because they simply do not have as many bees or foragers. Another reason why you might not want your bees to swarm is if you're in an urban or suburban location. Uh, swarms of flying bees or a cluster of bees, uh, quite honestly, they freak people out who aren't beekeepers. Every year in the news, we see pictures of swarms in the city, and they have to call out the, you know, the fire department or the the city beekeeper, and they have to get the bees, you know, off of wherever they ended up landing. And you know, if if there, sometimes the reporters will have video and picture about this exciting event, which, you know, is basically a completely normal, uh, you know, experience in the in the day of a beekeeper. And then finally, if you don't catch a swarm that flies off, rather than going into a hollow tree, it might end up in a place where it's not wanted, like the wall of a house. Uh, and these, if they're not noticed, they might not cause any problems, but you know how people are. Once they see bees are in a, a house, even if it's an out-of-the-way location, they're not hurting anything. They, they often get freaked out, and you know, they want to get them gone. And, you know, and if a beekeeper doesn't do a cutout, they'll, they'll call an exterminator. Uh, it can be a real mess to cut them out, and, and if the exterminator simply kills them and doesn't uh, get rid of the comb and the dead bees, I've heard stories of honey leaking into the house and ants and all kinds of things happening. So what are the factors that encourage swarming? It's complicated. This slide is really oversimplifies things. Uh, you could spend an hour talking about the, the factors that encourage swarming, but in general, it's several factors uh, that encourage this. Uh, for one, it, there can be a decrease in queen pheromone. If you have an older queen, her queen pheromone may be decreasing. Uh, or if there's a high population of bees in the spring, the queen pheromone is uh, dissipated throughout the hive and the queen pheromone begins decreasing. Or if you have a poor quality queen that they might supersede any other time of the year, uh, if it's in the spring during swarm season, they may say, well, we'll do a two for one. We'll uh, replace the old queen by swarming. If the hive is congested, if there's no place for the queen to lay eggs, the brood nest is full of brood, or if it's honey bound or pollen bound, um, you know, or just simply overcrowding of the bees themselves. Environmental conditions, you know, they're unlikely to swarm during a dearth when nothing is coming in because they instinctively know that this would be a terrible time to send a swarm out only to starve. But if it's in the spring and there's lots of flowers in bloom and it's a good year, uh, and then the weather is sunny and warm, then they, this is a perfect time for swarming. And they definitely may swarm even more so if it's been uh, several days or weeks of cool, rainy weather. You know, I, I, I mentor a lot of new beekeepers, and like after we have a period of cold weather in the springtime during swarm season, when we have a warm day coming up, I warn them, be, be on the alert. You, you know, if you haven't taken any precautions or haven't been in your hives lately, uh, they may want to swarm today. And sure enough, uh, you know, sometimes they have a bunch of swarms flying out on that day. And then finally, the type of honeybee. Africanized bees and other tropical honeybees are notorious for swarming. Uh, 
you know, for them, it's not as great of a risk to produce a small swarm because that swarm doesn't require a lot of resources to survive. There's not any winter. Sometimes they'll produce these tiny little swarms the size of a grapefruit. Uh, you know, and when they're small and they're they're not, uh, you know, established, they might actually be fairly docile until they build up into a full-size colony. Now, among the European honeybees, some strains are known or or supposedly have a higher rate of swarming. You know, Russians as compared to Carniolans, Caucasians, or Italians. Uh, I've had all of these kinds of bees, and I've you know all any one of them will swarm given the right conditions. And I find that you know the Russians and Carniolans, you know, they build up so quickly, so that's part of the reason why they're more likely to swarm in the spring. But if you give them space, uh, they they tend not to be any more likely to swarm than other uh, other types of bees. What are some of the signs that swarm season is here? Well, first drones are being raised. So from the egg until you have a mature drone, it takes maybe about six weeks. If you think about the math of you know what it takes for a bee to develop, a drone from egg to emergence takes about 24 days, and then another 10 or 12 days before it's sexually mature. So according to the calendar of bee development, you know it takes about six weeks from that drone egg being laid to where there's mature drones, and that's usually a tells us roughly how far off uh, uh, the swarm season is. Now, there are going to be different, you know, if there's a, a month of cold weather, it may delay swarming by a few weeks. And, and if it's an earlier spring, a warmer spring, they may begin swarming, producing drones and swarming earlier. But it is helpful to keep this, uh, you know, development of, of queens and drones in mind when you start thinking about how the colony develops and in the spring and how, sw how uh, swarm season uh, begins approaching. Queen cell cups being drawn out and polished. Now we see them all the time in the spring. It doesn't mean they're going to swarm until there's an egg laid within that cup. Commonly we see uh, queen cell cups at the bottom of the frames and they're basically little sh uh, cups without anything in them. Uh, you can see them on the face of the comb as well. And it's normal to see these in all colonies during the swarm season, even, even in the colonies that never end up swarming. Now once you see this, larva with royal jelly, now that's a queen cell, that's no longer a queen cell cup. And now you must do something, swarming is going to happen. And uh, you need to do more than just cutting these out, because the bees will just rebuild them immediately. You know, these are, you know, definitely older than a day old, and so, you know, it, it, it's only four and a half days to five days from uh, the egg hatching to capping. And any time after capping, the, the swarm could, uh, could issue from the hive. So these might be a day or two days out from being capped. Uh, so you don't want to see these and then just close up the hive and come back a week later because more than likely your bees will be gone or there maybe there'll be a cluster of bees hanging in a, uh, you know, in a tree somewhere. The other indicator I find to be useful is the the bloom of the flowers because every year is different. Some years. Uh, are warmer and the flowers bloom earlier. Some years they're colder and, and uh, the flowers begin later. Also, if you move, you know, you don't know what the swarming timing is in your new uh, area that you've moved to, but looking at the flowers can give you some insight. So when the dandelions begin blooming, that means swarm season is roughly four feet weeks away or so. Uh, once apple blossoms start uh, opening up and blooming, that means swarm season is here. And then lilac bloom is the peak of the swarm season. So prevention and management of swarming. We can think of swarm prevention and management techniques as either preventive, basically measures taken before, before swarm season is here, before the bees have decided they want to swarm. So basically this is before there are queen cells. Or reactive, that's once the queen cells are present, the bees have made a decision to swarm, and now we have to do some type of intervention to prevent that from actually happening. So swarm prevention before the swarm season arrives uh, includes several things. For one, making sure you have young, healthy queens. Um, here up in, nor in the north, we might consider requeening in late summer. So you have a young, healthy queen to overwinter, and you don't have to worry about you know, finding a queen early in the spring when they may be harder to find uh, you know, for an older queen that's maybe failing or something like that. Uh, make sure that queen has plenty of empty comb to, to lay her eggs in as the spring buildup begins. Uh, provide plenty of room for incoming pollen and nectar and try to keep the brood nest from becoming honey and pollen bound. You know, perhaps you may trade out some of those combs of honey and pollen to a weaker hive. Uh, you know, maybe you'll move them around. Maybe there's some empty comb uh, that the queen doesn't realize and you might move that into the or next to the brood nest. Uh, 
you know, on one of the online forums, I saw somebody uh, was scraping uh, the pollen and wax off of the brood comb because the the you know the the brood nest was pollen bound. And I, when I saw that, I just cringed because pollen is so valuable; it's protein, and the bees need to store it. And you know, especially in the times when there's a dearth and there's no pollen coming in, or in late winter when they begin building up, they want that pollen. So you you would definitely not just get rid of it. Um, if anything, you know, if you're a small backyard beekeeper, you could put these combs into your freezer and then just pull them back out later in the year when there's no more pollen so your bees can have access to them. And then always have extra ha equipment on hand just in case. Whenever I'm out checking my out yards, I always have extra boxes and extra comb on the back of my truck just in case I happen to see a swarm randomly, you know, driving along or, or I come to one of my bee yards and there's a hive that's about or more, you know, than one hive ready to swarm so I can start moving a, uh, some of the you know, excess brood out and put it into maybe another colony in another yard or maybe make up some nukes or whatnot. There are many methods of preventing swarms, but it pretty much comes down to managing these three components of the colony. The queen herself, the brood, the nurse bees, and the house bees that have not yet flown, so they have not yet oriented to their hive location. And then the older bees, the foragers and other bees which have been out of the hive and which have oriented to their uh, hive location. So there's many methods of preventing swarms before uh, the bees have decided to swarm. Uh, some, some beekeepers, especially in Europe, they like to cage the queen because it breaks the brood cycle. And if there's enough of a brood break, they can even apply an oxalic acid treatment. Myself, I don't really like doing this that much because to, to cage a queen during a time of year when the, the bees should be building up is abnormal and the bees will think there's a, a, something wrong with their queen because the, there's no more new eggs being laid. And so if, even if uh, you let her out of the cage after a, a, a couple of weeks, they might think she's a defective queen and they might decide to supersede her. Uh, there's opening up the brood nest, otherwise known as checkerboarding. Reversing the brood boxes. Uh, you know, sometimes the cluster ends up up top and there's plenty of empty comb below. Uh, separating the brood from the queen, uh, or making splits, which is one of my favorite uh, methods of preventing swarms. And, and to be honest, is, is the main method that I myself use to uh, prevent swarms. So opening up the brood nest, um, alternating the comb with, uh, with empty drawn comb, and then brood. First, you need to remove two or three combs of brood and nurse bees, uh, or maybe some that uh, resource frames with honey and pollen. Uh, you could, some colonies can even allow you to remove more than this if they're very strong. And those combs can go into a weak hive that uh, you know needs to be strengthened, or you can make a split with it. Uh, you can put it into a nuke. And then you move the combs around so there will be empty slots uh, where you can put some of the empty drawn comb, um, basically alternating between brood and empty drawn comb. And then you put the empty drawn frames uh, into the slots. Now, of course, when you took out the, the brood and nurse bees to start with, make sure you didn't take your queen with that. Obviously, that would be a problem. So you make sure that the queen herself is not on one of those combs that you remove to give to a weak colony or to make a split with. Uh, you make sure that you find the queen and that she stays in your original colony. Brood box reversing. I, I used to do this a lot when I first started out in the 80s. I don't do it so much anymore. It's mainly because I have so many colonies, I just don't have time to, to flip the boxes. But basically what happens is by the end of the winter and spring, the colony moves up as they eat through their honey stores, and they, they frequently will end up in the top box. And so the idea is by putting the top box on the bottom and moving the empty uh, drawn comb above, the, the queen can move up along with the bees uh, and find all this empty space to lay eggs in. Now, some bee scientists and entomologists say, well, you know, why would you do that? That doesn't happen in a tree. Uh, you know, they, they just kind of move down on their own. And, and that's true. Um, but, of course, bee, feral colonies in a tree, uh, they also swarm a lot. One thing that you do not want to do, however, is to break up the, the um, brood. So let's say the, the brood nest is uh, between the top and the bottom. If you... Uh, flipped them, then half of the brood would be up top, all the way to the tippy top, and the other half would be on the bottom. And, you know, so sometimes in colder weather, the bees might abandon some of the brood, and you might end up with some of the brood uh, dying. So that's, you definitely don't want to break it up. You only want to reverse if the brood nest is almost exclusively up top, and then putting it on the, on the bottom. Now, the DMARE method, it's, it was originated in the late 1800s, and there's many variations. Uh, basically, the open and capped brood is relocated above the honey supers and queen excluder. 
the nurse bees will be attracted to the brood and move up, reducing congestion, while the queen stays below with empty drawn comb uh, and lots of places for her to lay eggs. As the uh, brood emerges, you can pull uh, those empty combs down below and then trade up uh, with, some, with, with some brood now that the queen has laid. Uh, you need to make sure there's no queen cells after you first do this because, if it, especially if it's separated by a few supers, the top box may think it's queenless and it might decide to start some queen cells. So after you, you, you put that, uh, the brood up top, w within a week or so, you come in and you make sure there's no queen cells up top. And here's a diagram. It makes it a little bit more easy to explain, you know, where the brood is brought up top above the honey supers and the, the nurse bees move up there. Uh, one negative potential is uh, if you have a honey flow going on as the brood emerges from those top combs, uh, rather than being empty and being able to be brought down, it might be full with filled up with honey. That might be fine if you want to uh, use these combs for the, the hive uh, to winter over. But if this happens too soon in the year, you, you may actually become honey bound up there and you won't have anything. And so what you can do is take out those combs of honey and give them to hives that might need it or put it, uh, store it somewhere, maybe freeze those combs and pull it out later, uh, you know, in the fall to give the hives. Um, or, or you could even extract some of the honey and give it back. It's really up to you. One of my favorite ways to prevent swarms is making splits. Uh, I really believe in sustainable beekeeping, and one of those, uh, one of the aspects of sustainable beekeeping is to raise my own replacements. So by making splits, not only am I preventing swarming, but I'm also replacing any of the bees that died over the winter. Um, and then it can be an extra source of income. Uh, you know, sometimes people think they have hives that survive the winter and they end up dying, you know, in late spring, and it's too late to order in packages or nukes. And so they're, those folks are very happy to get splits if they're able to, and you could, they would be willingly, uh, you know, to buy them to take them off of your hands. Disadvantages, you need to have some extra equipment on hand. You either need to buy queens to put into these uh, splits or you need to produce your own. Um, and if not done correctly, you could weaken your production hives and produce less honey. I've seen splits done too early uh, before the bees have built up and, uh, and that can actually weaken the production hives and set them back from where they would be otherwise. And you possibly get up with more hives than you want, which myself, I never see that as a problem. But if you want to keep maybe the same number of hives roughly year to year, and you don't want to you know, double and triple your hive count every year, um, you can sell off the extra, or you can just wait until, like, say, the late summer and fall and unite them back together with each other uh, so you can have a strong, healthy colony going into winter. There's different types of splits. Um, you can just simply uh, divide a full-size colony, two, two deep box colony, into two single deeps. Uh, put one half on the new bottom board and the hot, whatever half doesn't have the queen, just uh, add a new queen. Or you could break them up into nukes, taking two to five combs of brood bees and resources each into a nuke box. I mean, you could potentially make it into, you know, a two deep box a colony up in, into four nukes if you uh, do it correctly. Uh, and then you need to have queens for these splits. Uh, you know, may keep the old queen in one of these, but the other ones that are splits off of that You'll ha they'll have to have a queen, and you can buy a mated queen. The benefit is, of course, she'll begin laying as soon as she's released from the cage. Uh, you could do what I do. You could uh, put a ripe queen cell in there. Uh, you know, I'm a queen breeder, so I always have ripe queen cells available uh, during the season. Um, and if you're like a backyard beekeeper, you could just simply use uh, a comb that happens to have some of the swarm cells that are, you know, on that comb. Uh, and make sure you put that, and, and be careful not to damage them, uh, to put those into your, uh, into your uh, splits. Some beekeepers like to do what they call walk-away splits. Basically, you split them, and, and then you just walk away, and they'll raise a new queen, and maybe in a month or so, you'll have a mated queen. I'm kind of lukewarm towards them. Uh, nothing against a walk-away split, but I, I, I basically have seen it done poorly so many times. You know, they make the split, and then they just, you know, they walk away, and it turns out most of the bees go back to the old colony. Uh, and they don't come back and, and look to see that, oh, this hive uh, this has been depleted and sometimes the brood dies and there's only a handful of bees left in that split. So what I recommend if you're going to make a walkaway split is to make that split and then transport it at least three miles away to a new bee yard so they don't fly back. Or if you want to keep it in the same yard, that's fine. But if you do a walkaway split, then make sure you walk back the next day or two to check and see how many bees are left. And if not enough, shake in some more bees until you have enough uh, young nurse bees that uh, will stay uh, in that uh, new split with the um, with the brood. Uh, 
Of course, there is a disadvantage because, you know, it takes a, a month before you have a new laying queen, and by then the bees are getting old, and if, if they fail, then you pretty much have set this colony up to being a, a, a colony of laying workers, which if that happens, it's not the end of the world. You can always just unite it back to the original colony. Um, but usually when I make splits, I will usually either put in a mated queen or a ripe queen cell in order to minimize that from happening. Now, Randy Oliver has uh, has uh, recommended this, and I, I, I strongly agree with that. When you make a split with a ripe queen cell, there's going to be a window where all of the brood emerges. The queen mates, and she begins laying eggs, and now there is new brood, but none of it's capped. And this is around day 19 or 21 after the nuke was made with a ripe queen cell. And that's a perfect window to treat with oxalic acid dribble or uh, sublimation, uh, some people call vaporization. Um, and because the mites are not in the capped brew, they're completely vulnerable to the oxalic acid, and it's just a great one-time treatment you can do for any of the splits that you've made with a ripe queen cell, whether it's a swarm cell or a queen cell that you produced. Now, I've seen splits done uh, poorly, as I mentioned, so there are certain things you need to do to, to make sure you're successful. As I kind of mentioned, make sure there's enough bees within the split you made. Um, later in the summer, you won't need as much bees and brood because the, uh, the nights are warmer, so they won't require as many bees to keep the brood warm. Um, and there may be more incoming resources, so you may be able to make a split with fewer combs as compared to making one earlier in the season. But whenever you make a split, always come back to check to make sure that, you know, there's enough bees and, and that the, if, if not, then add some more. During the honey flow, uh, the bees are pretty busy and not a lot of robbing is going on. But if there's a dearth and you made up some splits, you might have to use entrance reducers or even anti-robbing screens because some of the bigger, larger, stronger hives in your, in your apiary may decide to rob out the small splits you've made. Uh, make sure these small colonies have enough stores. And again, if there's not enough incoming stores, you may have to feed them. And then as the population increases, you could you know put them into full-size equipment or you could add a a super like a, a five frame nuke on top of a five frame nuke and stack them one on top of the other or you could borrow bees use them as brood factories as mike palmer has recommended you know for strengthening weak hives or you know making up cell builders for raising queen cells or whatever let's say you've say you've tried all these methods of trying to prevent swarming and you come to a hive and now you see queen cells so the colony now is in swarm mode they've decided they're going to swarm and it's going to happen. You can try all the prevention that there is, and they're still at, at times going to decide that they want to swarm. Well, you can cut out queen cells, but if that's your only intervention, that's a fool's errand because eventually they will swarm. It won't change their um, an instinct to swarm, and eventually you'll miss one queen cell, and they'll swarm anyway. I mean, I will do it if you know as a last resort. Maybe I'm out in an out yard, and I don't have enough equipment with me. Um, you know, I'll have to come back later that day or maybe early the next morning. Um, so I will destroy all the queen cells. And if I do that, I make sure I shake bees off of every single comb because only one queen cell on the face of the comb, you miss that, they will swarm. And it can happen any time after that cell is capped. And as you re recollect, uh, cells are capped at day eight after the egg is laid. But, you know, bees can start raising a queen from a newly hatched uh, egg, uh, even among the worker brood and they can cap it within five days. So it might not be eight days before they swarm. It could be as quick theoretically as five days, although realistically, usually it's not quite that quick. Usually it's uh, seven to 10 days after the, um, after the cells are begun. You can make splits, which I, I just talked about, or you can create an artificial swarm or a shook swarm, which consists mainly of older bees and foragers, the old queen and empty comb. Uh, and that's the Terranov and Snellgrove methods. So we already talked about splits when, you know, be just as a preventive uh, method, but when swarming is imminent, that is, there are, all, are already queen cells, uh, there's different ways to go about it. But one way is to keep the original hive in the original location with just one or two frames of brood, honey, and pollen, uh, and the old queen, and then the rest of the hive is withdrawn comb or foundation. All the old bees and foragers will fly back to this original location, but because there's very minimal brood, they'll be like, oh, this is not a good time to swarm, and usually that's enough to prevent them from wanting to swarm. And make sure that, you know, whichever of those frames of brood that you put into that original hive location doesn't have a queen cell on it. The rest of the parent hive goes into either splits as nukes or maybe into just a separate hive. Um, and you, you just put all the rest of the combs of brood and honey and pollen in there. And then after about one to three days, they realize they're queenless and you can introduce a mated queen. 
uh, make sure any queen cells that they have started uh, are removed because if there's any uh, left, they might decide we don't want this new queen. Uh, we'll we'll raise our own. Thank you very much. Uh, and the other other issue is if you decide not to use a mated queen or a ripe queen cell, if you let them raise their own from scratch, you know it might be two to four weeks of brood production that you lose. You know while those queen cells are, are raised from scratch, and then the queen has to emerge and then go on mating flights. And then anytime you make any splits, you always want to rebalance the population of foragers and brood later. Some of them might end up a little stronger than others, and and you might. Uh, you know, move some of the combs of brood to the weaker hive, or you might even just switch, you know, uh, you might just put the weaker hive on the location of where the original hive is on that stand and move the original, or whatever hive is stronger, and you move the other stronger hive, you know, to where the weaker hive was. So you can do that kind of switching also. The Terranova method, uh, I have some friends who really like this, and it, I have to say visually, it's it's kind of, it's pretty cool. You know, you can really see what's going on, and uh, you know, if you want to demonstrate for new beekeepers, you know, if you're a backyard beekeeper or you don't have a lot of hives and you have some time to do this, it, it's kind of a fun technique of uh, creating a, a, a shook swarm. Um, myself, I'm pretty busy and have lots of hives. I don't really have time for this, but I, I still think it's a kind of a neat method for someone who maybe doesn't have a lot of hives and wants to try something different. Uh, basically, there's a bore that slopes up toward the hive but is a few inches away from it, doesn't directly touch it. A sheet is put onto the board so that uh, there's an area to dump the bees, all of them, out of the hive, including the queen. Most of the older bees uh, and all the bees will climb up this ramp towards the hive. The older bees will jump across this gap, fly into the hive, where the young bees who haven't flown yet will form a cluster uh, below the top edge of the board. Um, and after, say, an hour, hour and a half, the, the, it's, there's a cluster of bees along with the queen underneath that board, and that can be taken and hived wherever you want uh, within that apiary into a new hive. And here's a little diagram showing how it works. So you've got the ramp, and you dump the, all the bees from the hive, including the queen, at the bottom. And they start running and climbing towards the hive. But only the older bees can cross that four-inch gap. The younger bees and the queen, they end up clustering below. And uh, once all the older bees have gone back in the hive, then you can take that cluster and shake it into a hive or introduce it into a new hive. It helps to put a little bar with maybe some cloth, um, some some old carpet stapled under so the cluster has a place to uh, to, to grab onto. Here's a photo showing uh, the bees as they've been dumped and slowly uh, crawling up the ramp and flying up into the hive. And now here is how the cluster looks after the old bees have gone into the hive uh, and the younger bees along with the queen have clustered below. Uh, now of course the bees in the the older bees that went back up into the original hive they don't have a queen so uh, you know, you either leave a single queen cell in there for them, uh, or you buy, you buy a new queen and you introduce a new queen to that now queenless hive. The Snellgrove, Snellgrove method, you know, originally it was a method to raise queens above a full-size colony. And I actually will use the double screen board as part of uh, making uh, queenless cell builders, especially early in the spring when the temperatures are uh, kind of cool and I need, want some of that warm temperature to come up from below from the main hive. But uh, Snellgrove discovered that this can also work as a method of swarm prevention. And there's a number of variations, but they all include a double screen. Basically, the warmth from the high below can rise upward, but the bees cannot touch each other with their proboscis. And so uh, because of that, they cannot spread uh, the queen pheromone amongst each other. And without that direct contact, contact the part of the uh, hive that does not have the queen thinks that it is queenless. There's different types of Snell Grove boards. Some have a small screen, some are almost completely an open screen, but there's two screens far enough apart that the bees can't touch each other. And they have these little doors or gaps that can be opened or closed depending on which way you want the uh, bees to fly out of. Here's a diagram kind of showing you on the left what the original colony was. So there's some queen cells with the queen. This colony decided it's thinking about swarming. And so the Snellgrove board is put up top, and then the queen and the queen cells and brood are put up top. And down below at the bottom, there's only one frame of sealed brood, ideally no eggs or, uh, or open brood, so the bees don't build a queen cell on that. Um, and then you open the gap or the door, one of the doors on the Snellgrove board, so any of the older bees that went up with the queen and the queen cells and brood, they will fly back to where they oriented, which is the, the box at the bottom. Uh, and then that box, bottom box will have older bees in it with that frame of brood, and they'll realize immediately that they're queenless. 
you should come back, say, in around five or seven days to look at that one frame on the bottom to make sure you didn't miss any eggs. And if there is a queen cell on there, make sure you, you remove it so they don't try to raise their own queen. Uh, meanwhile, the, the, the queen cells up top, if there's any capped queen cells, you should uh, remove them. But if there's any open queen cells or whatnot, you don't have to worry about them because uh, with the population depleted by the older bees flying downward, uh, they will realize we don't want to swarm now. Where did all the bees go? Uh, and so they will... Uh, tear down any of the uncapped queen cells and eventually after say day six you can take the queen down and those bees down below which were hopelessly queenless will be happy to see her and they'll accept her and they won't try to swarm anymore now the the bees up top uh, that are now queenless you can either re reunite them back with the original colony or you can take them uh, and, and put them in, into weak colonies or used to make splits or, or whatever and this is a sort of a, a written down description of how to use the Snellgrove method. It's actually a lot more complicated to write down than to show you how it's done. So I'm not going to sit here and, and bore you by reading every single line uh, in this slide. Catching swarms. I've got to say it's one of the most fun things that a beekeeper can do can, is catching swarms, especially if they're not from your hive, but they're a, a feral swarm or, or you know one that somebody called you about because basically you're getting free bees. Equipment for gathering swarms. Uh, it's important to have the proper equipment on hand so that you can collect swarms safely and also put them into the hive where that you're intending to, to put them or move them to. Uh, the most important is personal protective clothing. And I have to admit, some of us more experienced beekeepers do sometimes get a bit cavalier about wearing uh, clothing. Uh, I've gathered swarms with nothing more than t-shirt and shorts uh, and, and did just fine. But if you get a be uh, into your eyeball, for example, and they sting your eye, you know, you could potentially lose vision. So ideally, at the very minimum, you should have a veil. If you're collecting a swarm overhead, then it's good to have a jacket on because once you start shaking those bees, they may fall off and go down your shirt and they'll sting the whole way down. Um, believe me, I know, having experienced that personally. And if you're on top of a ladder um, while the bees are stinging you, uh, it's just really not a good place to be. That said, I have gathered swarms without clothing, and typically I'll only do that if it's a, a swarm that I know has chest issued out of the hive, and they're what we call a wet swarm. And what we mean by that is those bees are full of honey, and they haven't been sitting around very long, so they're usually fairly docile. Uh, if uh, it's a, what we call a dry swarm, uh, that means that swarm has maybe been out there hanging for several days or a week, uh, they've used up a lot of their honey, and they might be hungry and maybe a little bit irritable. And also, if that swarm has been hanging on a branch and somebody called you about it and they didn't know how long it was there, sometimes they'll start making a little bit of comb uh, where they've been clustered. And so that's no longer a swarm, but it's now an open air colony. So you start messing with them, they're going to they are going to be defensive. Um, obviously, if you're in Africanized bee territory, it doesn't apply to us up north, but that's another uh, situation where you really need to be careful and, and wear the, per uh, the personal cl uh, protective clothing. You'll need something to put that swarm in. It could be as simple as a cardboard box that you f happen to found, or it could be a five-gallon bucket. Uh, you can shake the bees in or brush them in. Uh, if I have a high swarm like this one, I'll put the bucket on a, the end of a, a pole and then shake them in that way. Something to put the swarm into, a hive or a nuke. Uh, if you're going to lock them up, you might need to have a screen on them so they can get, uh, get air and ventilation. Putting empty drawn comb in there will help the uh, help the swarm decide to, to stay there. And then other tools are useful too, like a bee brush or some of us have bee vacuums. If it's a high swarm, you might need to use a ladder. Uh, some folks use pruning shears or a saw to saw off or clip the branch and then bring it over to wherever they're going to hide that swarm. Queen cage is good to have on hand because if uh, uh, you see the queen, you can cage her and then you can put her where she's safe or put her in the swarm in the hive so that they uh, won't abscond on you. A drop cloth. cloth can be helpful to shake the swarm in front of the hive, especially if there's a lot of long grass. And then some of us use swarm attractants or smokers or even bee repellent to put back on the branch where if the... Well, the ne next thing you do is you place the hive you're planning on putting the swarm into near or on the ground below the cluster. Sometimes if there's a cluster uh, close to the ground, you can actually have them walk right in from that swarm. Uh, now if... Uh, 
the swarm is up high like this one, you might have to put the bucket onto a pole and shake them into there and then bring that down um, to shake into the hive. If you put a comb of uncapped brood into the uh, into the uh, hive, that, that's going to really be a magnet because they're not going to want to leave those baby bees. And what you do is you temporarily remove a few frames to make space and then you shake or uh, brush the swarm into the bucket or box and then you dump them uh, into the space where the frames were and carefully replace the frames without injuring the bees. Now some of the bees will fly back to the location of where they had clustered up above so you may need to go back a few times and shake some more bee bees back uh, into the front of the hive. Now if they all seem to fly back up you need to question whether or not you got the queen. It's possible the queen is still up there and so you need to just go back and continue to get more bees and shake them back uh, in front of the hive. But eventually the bees should start fanning and walking into the hive. Uh, any additional bees that you've gathered you can dump them in front of the hive and they should start fanning uh, and running into the hive. The bees should start fanning and running into the hive. I don't know how many times I've seen this in my beekeeping career, but it still is, is awe-inspiring. If you watch quick, uh, carefully, you might even see the queen trying to run in, and if you're quick, you can catch her and put her in a cage, and then put the cage into the hive. Uh, that way the swarm won't abscond or fly away without her. And then after you bring the hive home, after a day or two, you can release her. Uh, if possible, leave the hive until dark. Um, all the bees from the swarm should go into the hive, or if not, they, the ones that didn't find the hive uh, below the swarm, they'll usually end up flying back home. Uh, then seal the entrance and bring home. So what should you do with all the swarms that you caught? When I started out in the 80s, you know, I, I, I increased my hive numbers simply by catching a lot of swarms. Uh, and then when Varroa came in, the number of uh, wild swarms really decreased for quite a while. We went years without seeing any of them, and now they're, they're starting to come back, which is very encouraging. Um, even if you don't want to increase your hive numbers, they're great for replacing any losses, you know, any hives that died out over winter. Swarms are great for drawing out new foundation. I mean, think about it. They took in a bunch of honey, and they're stored in their honey stomachs, and they're starting to secrete wax because they didn't know where their nest was going to be, and, and they, they left that hive assuming they might have to draw out uh, new wax, new comb from scratch. And so if you put them on foundation, they're going to do a wonderful job drawing that out. And that's the same reason why a swarm is excellent for making comb honey. If you catch a swarm right before the honey flow, a swarm can be a great colony uh, to, to make hun uh, comb honey for you. After they've been established in their new colony, and let's say you don't want more colonies, you can just you know divide up the brood and uh, into weaker colonies to strengthen them. Uh, they can be a great source of uh, income. Uh, any hives that you, any uh, nukes or hives you don't want. A lot of new beekeepers might lose their hives in the spring and it's too late to order them from a nuke supplier or a package uh, breeder. So, you know, you can sell any of these swarms that you've established into nukes to new beekeepers. And then one of the best things, you know, I enjoy is just giving them to a new beekeeper starting out and maybe even call them to come help you and you can show them how to catch this swarm and then, then you give the swarm to them to take home. A lot of beekeepers started out that way with an experienced beekeeper helping them uh, uh, catch a swarm and then giving them that swarm and I'll tell you, people will never forget this. You know, even, even 10, 20 years later, people will, will remember, you know, when you're giving them that swarm and how they, they, you helped them start out as a beekeeper. Swarm traps. So swarm traps, you know, I look at them as, you know, they're not, you're not necessarily going to catch a swarm in every swarm trap. But when you do, it's, it's pretty awesome because, you know, it's free bees. I put some near every every bee yard, um, not right next to them, maybe 100 yards or so away, because I can't be around all hives at all times, and it's inevitable if, if, you're, if your hive's going to swarm, it's going to be on a day that you're at work or you're out running errands or something like that. And it helps keep the swarms, if you're in the city or the suburbs, from moving into places where they might not be wanted, like inside the wall or the roof of your neighbor's house. And again, they're, they're not guaranteed, and, and you might not catch a lot of swarms with them, uh, but when you do, it's, they're free bees. Uh, you didn't have to pay anything for them. All you had to do is, is the, spend the time to build and, and set up the, uh, you know, the nukes or the swarm traps. I know some beekeepers out here that uh, set up uh, swarm traps next to uh, yards of commercial beekeepers. Uh, 
you know, they don't want their bees to swarm either, but some of them have so many bees, they can't really prevent swarming as well as maybe a smaller, you know, a backyard or a sideliner can. And so if you can set those swarm traps, you know, across the road or down the road from a, a yard of commercial uh, bee, uh, beekeepers, um, you know, once the swarm decides to move into your equipment, they're your bees. And so you can get a lot of swarms that way. You can get a lot of free bees that way. In order to encourage the swarm to move in, you might use a swarm attractant such as lemongrass, which mimics colony pheromone, or even use some old dark brood comb to help attract scouts. If I have a swarm trap set up for a few years and it never catches any bees, um, if it's in my own yard where I know there's been a few swarms, I might simply move it to a better position. Um, or if I haven't caught any bees and maybe I'm trying to catch feral, feral swarms, maybe there's just not any colonies nearby and I might move it to another location. And this slide I showed earlier in the presentation, this is from Dr. Seeley's work. When you're thinking about making a swarm trap or building a swarm trap, try to keep this in mind. We're trying to make the perfect nest for uh, the for the colony so that uh, they'll 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 be tempted to move into it instead of somewhere else uh, you want to set it high off the ground um, put it in a site that's not too exposed and with smaller entrance hole now you can make swarm traps from just about anything uh, old hives or nukes with old comb can be very useful because if the swarm moves in there and you don't ha have a chance to check it for you know, a couple of weeks, they're going to start drawing wax, and at least it won't be as much of a mess as some of the temporary bucket-style uh, swarm traps. Um, sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll strap them into a tree on a branch of a tree, or sometimes even put them on the roof of a building with a, a wedge, of course, so that they're basically level sitting on top of that building. Um, if you do put old comb in there, though, you only want to leave it in for the duration of the swarm season because... Um, you know, wax moths will get in there. So if you try to just leave that old comb in there all summer long, you know, you're probably going to have wax moths getting in there and destroying that old comb. Now, I'll make temporary bucket-style swarm traps, uh, you know, out of old pots in places that are a little bit more remote. Um, you know, maybe people, you know, you know how people are. They'll see this up in a tree and, you know, maybe they're out deer hunting and, what's that? I don't know, let's shoot it. You know, and so, if, if you know, nothing much lost there if it ends up getting destroyed by, by somebody. Um, you know, you, it goes without saying you really should put them on, pub, uh, on on private land rather than public land, you know, because on private land you can get permission to do that. And I try to face them away from the road so people driving by aren't tempted to, uh, you know, use them for target practice. Uh, the ones that are the bucket style, it is a little bit harder to get the bees out if you catch a swarm. What I end up doing is bringing them home and then putting a normal hive above them uh, and basically as uh, the summer goes along the bees begin moving the brood begins emerging and they end up moving the whole colony the queen and the and the colony ends up moving up into the uh into into the normal uh you know frames of my uh, my empty frames that I'd put into a box above the swarm trap and eventually I can just remove the swarm trap uh, as the bees have moved out of it so that brings us to the conclusion of our presentation So ideally, it's best to be proactive about swarm prevention rather than reactive. Now, there are times when you don't have a choice. You open a colony during swarm season and they're full of queen cells, and then you have to react uh, to the situation and do something about it because swarming is imminent. Uh, on the other hand, though, if you are good at swarm prevention, you will minimize the instinct for your colonies to swarm. Not completely, but at least make it less likely. And one way is to keep healthy young queens in your colonies. For those of us up north, Spring buildup is, is, occurs quickly, and there's not a lot of time uh, to requeen in the spring. And also, queens can be more difficult to get in the spring, so you might consider requeening in late summer or fall. Uh, those uh, colonies can be overwintered, and come spring, with a young, healthy queen, they're less likely to want to swarm uh, in the spring. But you also need to take other precautions, too. Make sure your colonies have lots of space during spring buildup, and the brood nest doesn't become honey or pollen-bound. Make splits before swarming occurs. Uh, that way, uh, the colony population will not be too high, and the colony will never even think about uh, swarming in the first place. Always be ready for swarm season. Always have extra equipment on hand. There's nothing worse when you see a swarm and you have absolutely no extra bee boxes. You catch them, you have them in a bucket or a, or a cardboard box, and now you're trying to find uh, some bee boxes or run into town to buy uh, equipment to make a, a hive. It's always good to have extra hives and, and available just in case. But if you do find queen cells during swarm season, you have to do much more than just cut them out. 
I mean, maybe uh, you will do that, but you will need to come back later in that afternoon or maybe the next morning uh, to do some further intervention to keep that colony from swarming. And then finally, think about placing storm traps near all of your bee yards. And then if you have uh, access to private uh, property and permission, you can put swarm traps in other locations as well. Well, uh, that concludes this presentation. Uh, I, I hope that you found this information helpful uh, as you attempt to keep your colonies from swarming. Uh, thank you very much for watching.